Uh, okay, um, hello and welcome everyone to my talk. Um, I am uh, Jonathan O'Donnell and tonight I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the landscape of contemporary American demonology. I'm going to be a little outlining its various contours, uh, what it looks like, and kind of tracing some of its intersections with kind of particularly like far right and reactionary politics, because that's kind of my, my specialty within the landscape of contemporary America. Uh, so I'll be looking specifically at its, say, its connections to Trumpism, um, to like events and movements such as QAnon and the January 6th siege last year. I think that was last year. Feels like 10 years ago. Anyway, um, but as well as kind of tracing its connections to like broader reactionary currents in contemporary America, including like um, Islamophobia, uh, backlash against um, women and women's and LGBT rights, um, and kind of as well as um, against sort of movements for racial justice. So, firstly, I'm going to talk about what do I mean when I say demonology? So the term demonology is used by scholars in a variety of different ways that are often somewhat bracketed by time period. Generally speaking, when the term is used in relation to pre or early modern periods, such as sort of, um, the era of Second Temple Judaism or late antiquity with the rise of Christianity or then later sort of during the early modern period of like the quote unquote witch hunts in Europe. Um, demonology is used to refer to the formal or informal study or discourse around malevolent spiritual entities that are assumed to exist and are assumed to kind of um, interact with the natural world. Um, the, the material world. Following the Enlightenment and following the kind of rise of what we call modernity in Western Europe, um, particularly today, the term demonology is often applied somewhat more in a kind of more secularized or um, metaphorical sense to refer generally to kind of broader systems of dehumanization. So when people, and this is often what people mean when they talk about a like demonization, for example. Um, demon, like they'll talk about say the way that Jewish or Jewish people or black people or um, queer people, for example, are demonized. But that sense of demonization is broadly disconnected, um, at least in kind of concept from any more kind of, I guess, sense of demonology proper, like of that kind of, fundamentally kind of religious or theological discourse around so whether demons exist, what they are, what they do, how they act, etc. Uh, one of the things that I look at in my body of work um, is the relationship between these things, because one of the things that I look at is the way that what might be termed kind of demonology proper, like demonology in the kind of more theological or religious sense, is alive and well in the contemporary world um, and in the subjects of my study within contemporary America. Uh, and so one of the things I look at within that context is the way that religious or spiritual discourses of demonology of the existence and activities of malevolent spiritual entities intersects with its wider political context and the demonization or dehumanization of specific groups of people. And often one of the things my work, such as in my book, what I pay attention to are the politics around race and racialization, around gendering and secularization, gender and sexuality, as well as the kind of broader um, politics of colonialism, both settler colonialism and kind of um, and the sort of wider overseas colonial context and kind of the politics of imperialism more broadly. Um, and these are kind of some of the themes that I'm gonna be touching on um, over the course of this lecture. So what is the landscape of contemporary demonology specifically? So the form of demonology that I study today in contemporary America is primarily organized around what is sometimes referred to as spiritual warfare 
spiritual warfare discourse or the spiritual warfare movement. Um, spiritual warfare is a trajectory within contemporary Christianity that arises originally within kind of Pentecostal and charismatic sex forms of Christianity. Um, and is primarily is part of the general worldview in which the supernatural intervenes in and operates within the material world. Uh, you see this elsewhere in, for example, in notions of faith healing, um, of the speaking in tongues, of the belief in sort of the active role of prophecy in contemporary life. Um, but the specific aspect of it that I look at is its relation to notions of demonology notions of the way that demons operate are seen to operate in the contemporary world and the way that they are combated within this kind of body of discourse or literature um primarily through kind of deliverance rituals uh, or exorcism um all the way through to kind of certain activities such as prayer marches that i'll, I'll talk about a bit later um Although spiritual warfare kind of arises within kind of the Pentecostal denominations from especially the mid 1980s onwards, but also kind of before that, it spreads as a kind of way of thinking and practicing Christianity to kind of the wider landscape of evangelicalism in America and globally. It also exists in um, Eastern Orthodox um, forms of Christianity as well as in Catholicism. Um, it's essentially a kind of pan-Christian and pan-denominational form of spiritual practice. Most denominations in, the, in contemporary Christianity will have a group of people that practice spiritual warfare in some capacity, although the exact way they go about this um, will vary by like the particular groups they're affiliated with. Um, but they often tend to network primarily with each other rather than with non spiritual warfare practitioners within their given denomination, um, generally speaking, at least from the kind of in from my experience of studying the milieu over the past kind of decade or so. Um, spiritual warriors take their impetus, again, their kind of biblical impetus specifically from um, Ephesians 612, uh, which reads in the King James Version, which I'm kind of using because that's the version they tend to quote more often. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. The way the spiritual warriors take this um, phrase is that the purpose of um, a kind of believing practicing Christian is not to fight against other humans, but rather to fight against these kind of spiritual forces of darkness that lie behind and above them kind of influencing their behavior and influencing the material world. Um, this division is often far less clear in practice than it is in theory. And one of the ways that I've noticed that this tends to get used like throughout um, contemporary spiritual warfare, warfare practice is as a kind of um, elision of responsibility, a way of deflecting from critiques that these people are um, dehumanizing or othering specific groups of people by displacing their sense of action from those people to the forces they see as behind or manipulating those people. Um, this is kind of important because the forces that get explicitly demonized, as I'll kind of talk about later, tends to be kind of fundamental aspects of identity or existence that go against their particular understandings of what a kind of quote unquote true form of Christianity would be. Um, so for example, um, to use an example of like the kind of rise of Islamophobia in, in these contemporary movements, um, they will see Islam kind of conceptualized as an agential force of its own right as a kind of demonic power that is influencing Muslims in the real world. So they'll be like, we don't hate Muslims, but we hate like Islam as like some kind of preternatural force 
Um, but of course, then their struggle against, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers is essentially like an attack on Muslims, like as Muslims, um, as opposed to, so for example, another example would be uh, with LGBT people, they would identify say queerness or transness as like a power that is like essentially demonic in origin and is infiltrating or corrupting a kind of pure notion of the individual who then has to be kind of normativized in accordance with uh, these particular kind of models of um, a kind of normative, often white form of American Christianity. This is the form of spiritual warfare that starts to arise in the 80s. And one of the interesting ways that it operates is that it conceptualizes the world as essentially a battleground of spiritual forces over, um, to quote one uh, spiritual warfare manual from 2006, uh, one essential question, who will define reality on earth, heaven or hell? They conceptualize the world as a battleground between polar opposite spiritual forces who are kind of vying for the, effectively the kind of ideological definition of what counts as reality. Um, Frank de Pain, um, in his 2006 book, this 2006 book is an updated version of a book he originally released in 1989, um, titled The Three Battlegrounds, um, the, church, the Mind, the Church, and the Heavenly Places, I believe the subtitle is. Um, and you can kind of see in some way the influence of kind of the kind of Cold War geopolitics of um, America kind of playing out in this particular era of spiritual warfare, in that they conceptualize the world as essentially divided up between territorial spaces that are ideologically governed, and the goal is to infiltrate and transform those literal geographical and geopolitical territories um, to a different ideological structure. Yeah. Um, Rang Pen goes on to say that the battle rests not in physical weaponry, but rather in the power of agreement between mankind and the spirit realm. The idea being that basically by transforming hearts and minds, um, of individual people within given geographical territories, you can shift the kind of meta um, power structures around them from one that is conceptualized as demonic to one that is conceptualized as divine or holy. Um, yeah, this is essentially a spiritualized conflict over hegemonic perceptions of reality with the goal of spiritual warfare being to shift those, whatever the hegemonic perception of reality is. This is articulated within spiritual warfare texts like the one that I have displayed on the right hand of the screen um, in terms of kind of various hierarchies of demons that are adapted from that quote from Ephesians. So at the top of this hierarchy, you'll have principalities also known as rulers or as arche, um, who Jennifer Leclerc, one particular spiritual warrior describes as the CEOs or five-star generals of the demonic realm. Um, these are essentially conceptualized as the demons that exist essentially just below Satan in the infernal hierarchy and are often given fairly expansive portfolios that are often fairly ideological in or like political in concept. Um, so for example, Jezebel, who is one sort of arche that I talk about extensively in my work, tends to be conceptualized as the spiritual force behind feminism, LGBT rights, globalization, um, and a variety of other kind of from, like sort of political or ideological formations. Um, elsewhere, you'll get like Islam will be conceptualized as the kind of principality of its own right um, that governs that particular religion. So you'll have here the way that like demons are processed as behind kind of basically forms of worldview that are seen as antithetical um, to the one that these authors are kind of articulating. Yeah, uh, Cindy Jacobs, kind of one of the early founders of this form of spiritual warfare in the mid 1980s, um, writes in one 2009 book that there cannot be two ruling entities over a nation and that the goal is ultimately to establish God's rule into say, an area taking it back from the illegal usurper, Satan. 
um, geographical territories or nations are conceptualized as under demonic rule. This rule is coded as illegitimate and the language of illegality is often used uh, within this context. And the goal of the spiritual warrior is to reclaim those territories from demonic rule. Um, this is often accomplished through a variety of different spiritual practices, including uh, most commonly prayer, um, but also various other forms of practice. And also, I think critically, given the um, stated attempts to wrestle not against flesh and blood, it often includes like forms of material political action as well. Whether this is trying to elect people who are seen as kind of in line with their particular understanding of God's will. And we'll talk about that a lot more when we talk about kind of Trump later on. Um, or just kind of forms of kind of general social activism with environments that are based around kind of building um, strength um, within this particular form of spiritual practice. So, I'm mostly going to be, from now on, I'm mostly going to be talking about a variety of, sort of shifts and changes within spiritual warfare practice um, from the kind of early 2000s onwards. Um, starting with um, what I begin my book with, which is spiritual warfare um, within the kind of war on terror and the war on terror dice of paradigm, and then moving on to Trump. But first, I kind of want to touch a bit on spiritual warfare texts themselves. So one of the main ways that spiritual warfare is disseminated today, whether you know, it includes blogs, sermons, radio broadcasts, television channels, and a variety of other programs, uh, but one of the main methods are spiritual warfare manuals, um, texts that are written by Christian authors and distributed through primarily through Christian bookstores, um, but also kind of through the internet, through websites like Amazon, for example. Um, some of these can be, these vary from effectively self-published pieces um, to ones put out through kind of larger evangelical and charismatic publishing houses, such as Baker Books, Charisma House, um, Destiny Image Publishers in Pennsylvania, and, sort of, and, and also a variety of more fringe, but not technically self-published um, publications. Generally speaking, spiritual warfare texts fit along, like I've, I've read quite a number of them at this point. I think I've read something like 300 spiritual warfare manuals or thereabouts at this point in my career. Um, and I generally found they fall across a spectrum of, I guess, genre. So on the one end of the genre, you have books like Cindy Jacobs' uh, The Supernatural Life here. Um, this is essentially a self-help book, um, and a lot of spiritual warfare manuals will fall into this category, this category of kind of the self, effectively a kind of a Christian form of self-help manual, where the goal is to identify problems in your life, your family, your immediate environment, and credits these problems, these issues, to the influence of demonic forces in your daily life. The goal is then to uh, sort of basically channel the, the divine power of the divine, often through kind of dedicating your life to a particular form of Christianity. Um, and through doing so, deliver your life uh, or the lives of your loved ones from demonic influence. Um, but these essentially are, they're very personal. They're very geared around kind of personal or familial problems. There might be broader narratives around sort of the church as spiritual family and tensions within church life. But these are fundamentally very like localized um, forms of text in their um, targeting, even though they may involve like stories kind of taken from sort of transnational adventures or sort of missionary circuits and things like that. On the other end of the spectrum, however, you have books like this one, um, this is Forbidden Gates, the dawn of techno-dimensional spiritual warfare. Um, this is kind of a self-published text. It's put out by a small Missouri-based press called Defender. 
um, that I'll talk a bit about more later, um, that is run by Thomas Horton, who is one of the authors of this text. Um, these texts are far more conspiratorial in their framework. They will take a kind of, rather than the kind of more personal sense of books like The Supernatural Life, they'll look at kind of macro scale geopolitics. Um, they will talk about government conspiracies. Or they'll talk about quote unquote globalists. Uh, and in this case, they'll talk about like the rise of kind of techno science as this kind of threat to um, their understanding of Christianity. Um, this book is like, and they'll also often incorporate elements that are not unique to forms of Christianity. Um, so they'll often adopt a, ideas from kind of alt history texts, wider conspiracy texts, um, kind of contemporary spiritualities, or what are sometimes called like new age beliefs that sometimes get integrated into these. Um, but their primary differentiation is that they take a kind of macro um, scope of the world. They look at the role of the demonic in like global politics or national politics, um, rather than the kind of personal familial life. And then kind of midway between these points, you'll get a book like Stealth Attack by Ray Pritchard, um, protecting yourself against Satan's plan to destroy your life. Um, I put Stealth Attack kind of between these poles in that while in some ways it's a lot closer to the supernatural life, um, it couches its self-help rhetoric within a framework of contemporary transnational politics. Um, Stealth Attack is actually the book with which I open kind of my own book, and it essentially uses the analogy of the war on terror, um, of, the, of America's war on terror, as a conceptual framework for framing its spiritual warfare narrative. Um, for example, it conceptualizes Satan as the ultimate terrorist, quote unquote, um, whose like rebellion against God is processed as the quote first insurrection in the history of the world. Um, so he's analogizing things like the war in Afghanistan and um, the war in Iraq to the kind of and particularly the struggle between, say, the Taliban and the U.S. U.S. forces. In the, in the manner of the kind of struggle between um, God and the devil. Uh, obviously here aligning the United States with the side of the divine um, within his conceptual framework. Um, but these like these kinds of text, and you've got texts that are kind of more conspiratorial along this angle, but will still like generally shy away from going full kind of new world order style discourse. Um, but primarily this kind of text in the middle will kind of serve as a mediating points between uh, treatments of kind of global politics and treatments of kind of the more familial or personal aspects of these demonologies. But a book like Ray Pritchard's brings me on to a discussion of um, the way that contemporary demonology starts to operate in contemporary America, particularly in the 21st century, uh, particularly in the kind of post 9-11. Um, life. So <clears throat> one of the changes that happens with the onset of the war on terror um, with contemporary demonology in America, particularly in sort of spiritual warfare circles, is you start to get a shift in the conceptualization of the demonic itself. Um, during the early phases of spiritual warfare in the 1980s, you'll get like um, like I said earlier, there'll be this sense of geopolitical um, ideological binarization. Um, so you'll be the sense that there are global territories that are controlled by polar opposite ideological structures, capitalism and communism, for example, or God and the devil um, within these people's framework. And the goal is to conquer the territory of the opposing side and convert it to your particular ideological structure. And it's conceptualized as this kind of back and forth struggle with the demonic like seizing territory and then events of Christians having to fight back and reclaim that territory. Um, you get a shift during the early phases of the war on terror um, in which the demonic starts to be conceptualized far more on the model of asymmetrical warfare. Um, you'll have a continued analogy between the US and um, the divine, 
But both the US and the divine come to be conceptualized as global, as omnipresent, as, um, yeah, as totalizing in their power. Whereas the demonic will be conceptualized as far weaker, as kind of more localized, as sort of struggling within like particular like small geographical territories, where the kind of individual nations or sometimes individual cities within nations. But there's this sense of kind of radical asymmetry that starts to come to the fore. But the more noticeable thing that comes to the fore is the identification of the enemy within these things. During the Cold War and even during the post-Cold War period, and I'll kind of come back to that a bit later with the kind of legacy of, of, of the Cold War within these texts, um, communism is seen as sort of the demonic ideology um, par excellence within these frameworks. As kind of number of scholars who sort of look at the rise of reactionary politics and the rise of kind of American empire more broadly in the later 20th century, um, people have noticed that during the late 90s, um, there was a shift in the image of the enemy, quote unquote, within American domestic and foreign policy and within um, kind of reactionary discourses from communism to Islam. Uh, and this is a trend you see within spiritual warfare itself. It starts before 9-11. Um, it starts very much in the 90s. There are a few texts from kind of 96, 97. Um, that take an explicitly spiritual warfare framework and kind of encapsulate Islam as this great, great threat to Christianity and to the American way of life. Uh, but this really explodes in the post 9 11 era. Um, in 2004, several texts are released, including the classic names such as From 9 11 to 666 and Islam and Christianity, The Final Clash. You know, books along these kind of titular veins, um, which essentially kind of ramp up this literal demonization of Islam and this integration of Islam within contemporary spiritual warfare. Um, this kind of reaches a watershed moment in 2009 with the publication of Joel Richardson's New York Times bestselling book, The Islamic Antichrist. Uh, which essentially is a book that appropriates and tries to assimilate forms of Islamic eschatology and Isla in both is Islamic and Islamist political writings um, into a kind of Christian apocalyptic framework, um, setting it up as this kind of final eschatological enemy for um, the West, broadly conceived. Um, but there are kind of much wider texts. And I think it's interesting to look at the charting of one particular author, um, not from the early war on terror period, but from the kind of 2010s era. And this is Michael Yusuf. Uh, Michael Yusuf is an Egyptian born um, American Christian uh, who wrote a series of texts um, that are all essentially using a spiritual warfare framework to demonize Islam. Uh, and I'm just going to bring up some of the titles that he has here. These are in chronological order that he releases them. Um, so these are 2013, 2015, 2017, 2018, 2019 in publications, moving from left to right. Um, Yusuf is an interesting case here because his early texts um, Jesus, Jihad, and Peace, and End Times and the Secrets of the Mahdi, um, are both very standardly spiritual warfare manuals in a lot of ways. Um, they're highly Islamophobic. Um, they appropriate and misinterpret and kind of reframe um, various Islamic texts as a way of kind of demonizing not like, like Muslims and Islam, um, as a kind of threat to Christianity specifically. But generally, they both take highly kind of spiritualized, not apolitical, but like attempting to be apolitical stances. This obviously shifts in the latter three books, at least overtly. Um, so you'll see that they have at least the second and two that I have here from 2017 and 2018, which are the barbarians are here, 
preventing the collapse of Western civilization in times of terrorism, and the hidden enemy, aggressive secularism, radical Islam, and the fight for our future. Both of these texts take a far more like overtly politicized tone. And it, I don't think it's coincidence that these are both released um, during the early Trump administration um, from kind of 2016 onwards. Um, they're far more overtly political. They take that spiritual warfare framework from the early two books, um, but, but reconceptualize it within a kind of broader reactionary politics of um, ideas of the great replacement, for example, which is the idea that um, essentially the idea that like, oh, how do I conceptualize great replacement ideologies? For those of you who don't know about great replacement ideologies, it is a conspiracy theory um, on the reactionary right, both not specifically Christian, but kind of more broadly, that claims that white Christian Europeans and or Americans are being culturally and demographically eroded through processes of immigration. In America, this is often conceptualized through immigration from Latin America, but also from elsewhere in the world. In Europe, it's specifically anti-Muslim. Um, it's geared around the movement of Muslim migrants from North Africa and the Middle East into Europe. Um, and it codes these as a kind of threat to quote unquote Western civilization. Um, often there's an anti-Semitic element to these in that the, this, this kind of movement of migration is processed as, is framed as this um, plot by um, Jewish people, essentially, like within these reactionary ideologies. Um, Yusuf like deliberately shies away from the more anti-Semitic elements of this, and that kind of touches on the broader role that Christian Zionism plays within spiritual warfare networks. And like that's not a topic that I'm going to be talking about too much at the moment, but I might talk about in the Q and A session. Um, but Yusuf is very much adopting those more wider, ostensibly secular reactionary discourses from the far right and incorporating them into a kind of Christian um, spiritual warfare framework. So you see this kind of confluence of like far right ideologies more broadly kind of within this, this of trajectory. Um, the third jihad at the end is very much kind of continuing um, this trajectory. Um, also, I think relevant here and something that I'll talk about later is the highlighting of aggressive secularism, quote unquote, within the title of the hidden enemy. Um, there is often a conceptualization in these texts that quote unquote Western civilization is being eroded by essentially kind of quote unquote anti-Western ideologies. Um, this usually includes ideas of secular humanism or feminism or LGBT rights that are seen as like essentially like eroding the virility of, of Western civilization and leading it, leaving it open to um, attack from outside, quote unquote. Um, so these are, the, I think this is a good encapsulation of the way that um, Islamophobic narratives and Islamophobic concepts are kind of integrated into these frameworks. And this kind of leads me on to the Trump era, where you see, um, with the publication of the Barbarian here and the Hidden Enemy, a kind of ramping up of this, but also kind of more broad um, conceptual frameworks that come to be in this period. Um, here's a picture of a bunch of pro-Trump charismatics praying over a literal golden statue of Trump. Well, I guess it's a gold-plated statue of Trump, but. Um, I don't know, I just kind of love this image. Um, Trump is an interesting figure uh, within contemporary charismatic Christianity. Um, a lot of evangelicals did not get on board with Trump very early on. Some of them only switched to supporting him in 2015 or 2016 after Ted Cruz uh, dropped out of the race or various other candidates dropped out of the race. Um, but of those who did support him from fairly early on, a lot of those are white, um, not exclusively white, but white, conservative, charismatics, and Pentecostals. 
Um, most notably here would be um, Paula White, who was, was Trump's personal spiritual advisor, uh, who was the woman you see on the kind of left hand of the statue um, with the blonde hair. Like, and like she's a, she's a charismatic Pentecostal, like charismatic preacher. Um, she deals quite heavily in spiritual warfare. Um, but essentially, like, spiritual warriors rallied behind Trump in quite significant ways. Um, one of the most sort of quintessential examples of this, which I find kind of fascinating, is the creation and release of the Trump prophecy, which you see a kind of poster for at the bottom. Uh, the Trump prophecy is, it was a 2018, 2018 movie um, released by, or created and released by Liberty University. Um, that is essentially a biopic propaganda film of pro-Trump sort of Christian nationalist um, spiritual warfare discourse. Um, the first two thirds of the movie are a biopic story of a man named um, Charles Taylor. I've forgotten his name now, not Charles Taylor. Um, I'll talk about him in a minute. Um, <laughs> sorry, apologies for that. Um, he's an ex-fireman. Um, he starts seeing visions of Trump being president um, and essentially sort of comes to lead or be the inspiration figure for a kind of nationwide movement that is processing Trump, that is kind of gets behind Trump and sees him as this quasi messianic figure who's going to kind of rest, you know, make America great again, like restore American power. Um, restore like American sort of Christianity, both domestically, but also I think critically internationally. There's this intertwining of um, American domestic Christianity, of white evangelicalism with America's kind of global um, supremacy and power in like this context. Mark Taylor, that's his name. Um, the last third of the movie, however, is a series of interviews with a number of, of charismatic and evangelical figures who are pro-Trump about like their hopes and aspirations and reflections on the Trump presidency. Um, so it essentially shifts from a not technically non-fiction, but like more kind of biopic narrative movie to a series of propagandistic interviews. The Trump Prophecy is interesting because it is based on a book titled The Trump Prophecies um, by Mark Taylor that was released the year before. Um, and it was released um, by Defender Publishing, that text from um, the publisher of the Forbidden Gates book from earlier. Um, it was at that time, I think, one of the only books of prophecy they published. They tend to publish more kind of overtly conspiratorial texts that are more geared around fringe demonologies, like even within the contemporary, spir um, contemporary spiritual warfare um, milieu. Um, and there's a really interesting, I think, I think, I think there's a moment within this that becomes quite neatly encapsulated in which essentially this text published by an unknown author in a fairly fringe charismatic press um, is then picked up by Liberty University, which not only is a kind of prominent evangelical um, institution, but is also notably generally not a spiritual warfare institution, who then turn it into a movie that gets a limited cinematic release within 2018, and is essentially a kind of Christian nationalist propaganda piece. Um, how does this happen? It's like, it's a really, I think, interesting and neat crystallization of the confluence of the Christian right broadly, both the charismatic spiritual warfare side, but also sort of the non-spiritual warfare, um, simply sort of general conservative evangelical milieu kind of in the Trump era. Um, this led, this was part of a kind of wider trend of evangelical and charismatic texts that were published in this period. Um, several of which have kind of got aligned at the bottom there. Um, Stephen E. Strang, the president of Charisma House Publishing, published a number of books. Um, the first of which was this God and Donald Trump book, 
um, which is an interesting book in that, which apparently has a forward by Governor Mike Huckabee in this context. Um, God and Donald Trump is an interesting book because it is essentially a narrative of Strang's own conversion to Trump's cause over the course of the presidential election. Uh, it begins with him talking about how he supported Ted Cruz originally, and then sort of essentially narrates how he was brought into the fold um, by Trump himself and the promises he made, but also by Trump's widest support, like within charismatic and Pentecostal conservative Christians like Paula White, uh, and the way he was kind of won over by their um, so I said, you know, like their influence and their proselytizing on behalf of Trump's cause. Um, from this, you get more overt texts, um, perhaps sometimes more conspiratorial or more um, radical in their framework. Um, God's Chaos Candidate by Lance Warner, who's a Texas-based pro-Trump pastor, was released actually shortly before the 2016 election, kind of like didn't necessarily say that Trump was going to win, but heavily implied it, and that gave him several kudos and speaking circuits within the evangelical right at the time. Uh, and this is essentially a narrative about how Trump is going to be like a wrecking ball to like the spirit of political correctness, I believe Warner calls it. Uh, but essentially this kind of dem demolishing power um, within contemporary America, it's gonna kind of radically transform um, the state of things. And this is then carried over in some of the later texts that get released, such as Paul McGraw and Troy Anderson's Trumpocalypse, The End Times President, A Battle Against the Global Elite and the Countdown to Armageddon. And then uh, Robert McGuinness's The Deeper State, um, Inside the War on Trump by Corrupt Elite Secret Societies and the Builders of an Imminent Final Empire. Uh, these are both overtly apocalyptic texts. They draw on end times prophecy and end times narratives and kind of place Trump often at the center or at least as a kind of catalytic force um, in this kind of end times drama in some ways. Um, the deeper state obviously draws quite heavily on the conspiracy of the deep state that became very popular within um, during Trump's presidency and indeed continues to be in groups like QAnon. Um, but like, it is essentially geared around the idea that there's this level of bureaucracy of human actors that are combating Trump, but then behind those actors, kind of in the, the deeper state, as the title suggests, is the realm of the demonic. The realm of the demonic is kind of ultimately this kind of orchestrating force, like against Trump's presidency in this context. Um, and just start looking at the time. So it's like coming up to 20 past eight. So I'm gonna have, to, I'm gonna move along quite quickly now. Um, so yeah, this lead then leads into the kind of broader context of spiritual warfare in the sort of state of Trump's America and also kind of post Trump's America. Um, here are some other texts uh, and then including another one by Robert McGuinness because I just love this book cover. I just think progressive evil is kind of hilarious as a book title. Um, I do like how the Statue of Liberty on it looks vaguely ominous and it's not entirely sure. I'm not entirely convinced when I look at this title whether the threat is to the Statue of Liberty or from the Statue of Liberty. And I, I think that's, that's fairly illustrative of a lot of these discourses in a lot of ways. Um, these are texts that essentially kind of take the um, environment that Trump kind of fosters in America and then kind of code it through the realm of spiritual warfare, through the realm of the demonic in kind of new ways. Um, Trump Aftershock is the sequel to God and Donald Trump by Stephen Strang and is essentially kind of looking at the early phases of Trump's presidency and like the backlash among um, progressives and Democrats and sort of women's liberation organic groups and Black Lives Matter and various other groups and kind of coding these as um, essentially demonological threats to the kind of divine order that Trump is kind of destined to facilitate. Um, from here you have like more specific ones like skipping over progressive evil for time I might come back to it later. Um, 
Jezebel's War with America by Michael Brown is primarily based around gender and sexuality. Um, it's about the threat of, um, it, take, it takes up things like the Women's March, for example, in early 2017, um, and various other kind of feminist and LGBT rights organization struggles for um, reproductive and queer and trans rights in contemporary America and frames these as this kind of demonic plot, specifically by Jezebel, which here is either a demonic spirit or a group of demonic spirits that are seen as um, aligned with um, feminist or queer right causes, for example. Um, causes that are seen as antithetical to this kind of strong masculinist patriarchal form of Christianity that Trump is kind of seen as embodying. Um, progressive evil, just to skip over it quickly, is very similar, um, takes more uh, a specific task at the sort of idea of communism and like the threat of the rise of socialism, kind of particularly geared around um, the kind of things like the Bernie Sanders campaign, for example, and the kind of rise of kind of post-occupy America. Whereas the last book, Lawless, End Times, The End Times War Against the Spirit of Antichrist, um, is specifically geared around, it's the far more recent of the other of the other ones, and it's more geared specifically around the quote-unquote threat of groups like Antifa or Black Lives Matter to the kind of racial or sort of capitalist order of the United States. It's this idea of the kind of threat of social unrest um, as challenging uh, this kind of contemporary American spiritual order. Um, which is in this is kind of ends up being very aligned with ideas of kind of particularly like white Christian nationalism, um, sort of hetero patriarchy, uh, particular forms of kind of contemporary neoliberal capitalism, and sort of various other orders that are seen as kind of it's the, it's the threat of kind of the threat of the rise of the underclasses like within contemporary America and the challenge that these offer to kind of the the dominant social order. And this then brings me on, I think, I think I'm gonna close on the next slide to briefly to QAnon and to the um, role of spiritual warfare within the QAnon movement and within contemporary um, insurrection, for example. So we all remember the um, insurrect, the kind of the uprising or insurrection that was attempted by kind of far right reaction with group. Was that less than a month beforehand, many of the same people involved um, had gathered on December 12th in Washington for a Jericho march. Um, this is the picture in the upper right, is a picture of the Jericho march held on um, December 12th, which was kind of organized on behalf of the Stop the Steal movement, which is a conspiracy belief that Biden stole the election and that Trump conspiracy movement. Um, a Jericho march is essentially a form of contemporary spiritual warfare practice in which individuals will gather in a place and they'll circumambulate the, the, the location and they or they'll walk through it or near it and they will offer various prayers and sort of militant forms of prayer that are designed to kind of delegitimize and tear down the spiritual strongholds of the demonic forces that are seen as kind of enthroned there. Um, it's very, it's based heavily on the idea of like the model of Jericho from the Bible and the idea that you kind of walk around the city of Jericho a number of times and the walls come tumbling down. Um, this was held in Washington, DC. It was specifically targeted at Congress and at the, the Justice Department, various other forms of government, um, gov um, government institution in contemporary America, that these people saw as um, rejecting Trump's like rightful claim to the presidency, essentially. And the Jericho March served um, to 
as a kind of rallying cry, but also as a form of spiritual warfare practice, um, geared around delegitimizing these institutions and kind of opening them up to reclamation by God's forces, essentially, which is, in fact, at least in the minds of the spiritual warfare practitioners who took place on January the 6th, exactly what they were trying to do. Um, trying to uh, reclaim lost territory that was ostensibly being sort of conquered or overtaken by, usurped by demonic forces for the power of the divine. Um, I think one of the most interesting things about the Jericho March on, on December 12th is that it involved not just evangelicals, but also conservative, charismatic Catholics and Eastern Orthodox practitioners. It was essentially a kind of pan-Christian spiritual warfare event that was geared specifically around Trump's presidency and defending threats to Trump's presidency. Um, this then plays more widely into the way that spiritual warfare has become a key component of evangelical right discourse more broadly, also conspiracy movements like QAnon, apart from the versions of QAnon that are more geared around sort of contemporary spirituality, although there's often a lot of bleed through between those things. Um, I'm just checking what the time is. Oh, perfect. So, I think that's kind of where I'll wrap up there. I'm happy to answer any questions or expand on some of the points that I brought up. Um, if any of this is interesting to you, um, you may want to look at my book, uh, where I don't actually talk about Trump particularly extensively, but I talk about a lot of the underlying concepts and movements and sort of belief structures that inform spiritual warfare and inform the kind of wider um, ideological structures um, and kind of political and cultural and spiritual conflicts that are at work in contemporary kind of contemporary American demonologies, um, including its kind of wider imbrication with kind of Amer notions of American exceptionalism, ethno-nationalism and um, empire management globally. So um, thank you very much. I will wrap up there and we have about half an hour for questions and answers.